Well, good morning and welcome to Morning Mail. Today is Thursday, the 17th of February, 2022. Good to be with you this morning. I trust that your day has gotten off to a good start. Cold and chilly here in Hereford, but we did not, that I know of, get any of the snow that they were talking about the possibility of uh, overnight last night. Let's begin this morning with prayer, and then we'll get back into our survey of the book of Ephesians. Gracious Father, thank you for the day that you blessed us with and for the past night's rest. Thank you for the opportunity at this time to spend a few minutes in your word and to share some thoughts that uh, are hopefully will encourage and uplift us uh, to be better servants of yours, to be stronger in our faith and in, and in our desire to serve and to do your will. Father, I continue praying for the tensions around the world, and particularly Ukraine, for the peace of Ukraine, for the safety of the people there, especially the Christians who, who are doing the marvelous work of spreading the gospel in, uh, in their nation, for the U uh, Ukrainian Bible Institute, their staff and faculty and the students, and I just pray, Father, that they all be kept from harm and that they c can take advantage of opportunities that are presented. Father, be with our country as we deal with the situation in Ukraine, as we deal with COVID, as we deal with economic uh, difficulties, with inflation, uh, just so many things that are going on, unrest. Uh, we just pray, Father, for the peace of the United States, the peace of the world. Thank you for Jesus who came as the Prince of Peace, who offers the only true peace there is, and that is being in a right relationship with you as your child in the forgiveness of our sins. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, in our morning mail for yesterday, we began looking at a survey of Paul's letter to the Lord's Church in the city of Ephesus. As we read through Ephesians, we can sense two major purposes. First, Paul wished to explain the nature of the Lord's church, God's new humanity, by showing its origin and its composition of both saved Jews and Gentiles, plus its eternal purpose. That's in chapters 1, 2, and 3. Second, Paul sought to call God's new humanity to proper conduct, chapters 4, 5, and 6. Proper conduct involves putting the highest priority on unity in, the, in daily living. Ch chapter 4, verses 1, uh, excuse me, highest priority on unity in the body of Christ, chapter 4, verses 1 to 16 and seriously pursuing godliness in daily living. Chapter 4, verse 17 through chapter 6, verse 9. Cautiously expecting satanic resistance all along the way. Chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. Now, the central theme of Ephesians is embedded in these verses. First, Chapter 2, verses, verse 15b and 16, quote, So that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God, through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity, end quote. And then, chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, quote, So that the manifold wisdom of God might, be, might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out 
in Christ Jesus our Lord. End of quote. Now the major message of Ephesians centers on the saving action of God through Jesus Christ to create God's new humanity in the midst of the old. John R. W. Stott, in his book, The Message of Ephesians, God's New Society, page 25, wrote, The letter combines, quote, Christian doctrine and Christian duty, Christian faith and Christian love, excuse me, Christian life, what God has done through Christ and what we must be and do in consequence. End of quote. Paul wrote the Ephesian letter to Christians who were inclined to fail to put their spiritual resources to good use. Christians today can make that same mistake. We have tremendous possessions in Christ. And no Christian should ever become spiritually malnourished or wasted. We simply need to put to good use what God has provided. Now turning to the text, chapter 1 verses 3 to 14 sets the tone for Christians to take inventory of the riches of God. In the original Greek, these verses made up a single extended sentence. It amounts to a trumpet, a, a triumphant blast of praise to God, encompassing the past, verses 3 to 6a, the present, verses 6b to 11, and the future, verses 12 to 14. Let's focus this morning on chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Paul's enthusiastic call to praise. He wrote, quote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. End of quote. <coughs> Excuse me. Before the earth existed, God desired to share with Christians his love and his riches. God's nature prompts him to express his love towards others and to share his riches with them. The Greek word for chose in verse 4, he chose us, literally means to choose out, to select. The voice Paul used for this verb indicates that this is something that God did for himself. God determined by his own free choice to create sons and daughters in his own image. He gave them the ability to enjoy being with him, loving him, sharing his home, and praising his name. God freely chose to make us sons and daughters. What are we to do with the idea that God chose us to be his children in Christ? Two things. We can settle for less, discounting the notion that God wants us to be his children. Most people, in fact, do this. God seeks sons and daughters from whom he can open the vault uh, for whom he can open the vault of heaven. We're given the choice. We can settle for less. Unfortunately, many do. On the other hand, we can choose to accept God's best. His aim is to adopt us and make us his children, to make us heirs of his riches 
to bring out his image in us and to share heaven with us forever. And before we go on, think for a moment. Where are you in all of this? Are you settling for less? Is God's choice to make you his child and to give you heaven's riches something that makes you marvel? Do you not desire to let this happen in your life? Well, God gives us every spiritual blessing in Christ. Now this phrase, or its equivalent, occurs more than 20 times in the book of Ephesians. Paul made prominent use of it in these early verses, this long sentence. He says, the faithful are in Christ, chapter 1, verse 1. Every spiritual blessing is in Christ, verse 3. We are holy and blameless in Christ, verse 4. Grace is freely bestowed in Christ, verse 6. Redemption and forgiveness of sins are in Christ, verse 7. And the chosen are in Christ, verse 9. And then verse 13, we are marked or sealed in the Holy Spirit to guarantee our inheritance in Christ. Folks, these affirmations indicate the significance of being in Christ. Now, we might appreciate being in Christ even more if we were to compare it to something we know. Let's substitute for illustration's sake in the family for the words in Christ. When you belong to a family, either by birth or marriage or adoption, what does that mean? Well, if you are in the family, you have certain privileges. When I walk in the door of my home, no one asks, who let you in? My wife, Linda, does not act as if I'm an intruder. My daughters, when they lived at home, did not call the police. They all know that I belong in their house because I am in the family. Privileges, responsibilities, and expectations are all part of being in the family. To be in Christ means that you belong to him. You have been united with him. All the privileges, responsibilities, and expectations of being in Christ are yours. It does not send shockwaves through the corridors of heaven when God gives you a place in his kingdom. That comes with being in Christ. Angels do not faint when God sends his spirit to dwell in you. That comes with being in Christ. No one objects that God forgives all your sins. That comes with being in Christ. After your life on earth is done, no heavenly being will wonder why you have a place in God's eternal home. That comes with being in Christ. In Christ, you come to possess forgiveness of sins, adoption as God's child, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Christ, you have the hope of eternal life, holiness, righteousness, goodness, glory, and strength. 
in Christ you have steadfastness, peace, power, and all the rest of the riches of God. Now these privileges sound amazing, do they not? All that a person comes to possess in Christ defies description. Well, if I possess all of this in Christ, why do I still grapple with guilt at times? Why do I not feel holy, righteous, or good? Why am I so weak in some areas? Why do I still sin? The scriptures say, that I am God's child. But I certainly do not act like it all the time. I often put self first. I let myself and others down. Now most Christians ask themselves such questions as those, including elders, parents, preachers, Bible class teachers, those who have been Christians for years. Well, let me give two suggestions that that help when I begin to think like this. First, get back to basics. I must reaffirm my identity. I am God's child. God has made me his child through Christ. That is what he wants me to be. And then I must reaffirm for myself that I am in Christ. In Galatians 3, verses 26 and 27, Paul would write, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. End quote. That is basic. If I have acted based on faith in Christ and have been baptized into Christ, then I am in Christ. In Christ then every spiritual blessing is mine. Now, the second suggestion is use the basics. When I'm discouraged with myself, I can often trace that discouragement back to a neglect of the basics. I have not used my possessions, and that leads to spiritual starvation. The basics include, one, the Word of God, studying it, memorizing it, meditating on it. Two, prayer, having regular communion with God. Three, service, personally participating in kingdom work. And four, fellowship, sharing life with fellow Christians. How foolish it would be to see what God offers in Christ and to turn it down or fail to make use of it. God wants to give you every spiritual blessing. Do not walk away from his offer. Well, on tomorrow morning's Morning Mail, we're going to move on in this beginning section of Ephesians chapter 1 as we consider the only way one may come into God's family, that is, by adoption. I hope you can join with me then as we look at that uh, our adoption in Christ. Let's bow now in prayer as we close out for today. Loving Father, I thank you again for the day that you've blessed us with and for this passage of Scripture that encourages and uplifts us 
as it reminds us of your great love and mercy and grace and the blessings, all spiritual blessings that are ours in Christ Jesus. May we, Father, realize what that means to, to be obedient to the gospel and baptism that puts us into Christ, into his body, the church, and that, Father, we might relish in that, not for our glory, but for your glory, as we, as your children, seek to honor and glorify you as our Father, our Creator, our Redeemer, and Savior through Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, I pray your Thursday's a good one, and we'll, Lord willing, we'll be back tomorrow at 10 o'clock for more Morning Mail.